Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francisco Fonseca, for sharing your insight into the subject. Uh, now we have another eminent speaker from the USA, Mr. Haris Khan, who is a senior executive at the Saber Security and Defense Consulting Group. Uh, his forte has been homeland security and counterterrorism with a concentration on violent extremism, while he also studied the cybersecurity uh, and terrorism about critical infrastructures. Uh, today, he will be providing the policy orientation related to the cybersecurity of nation states, as he's an expert on South Asian and Gulf country affairs, and also have an experience of working in the joint interagency defense and diplomatic environments. So, uh, Mr. Khan, uh, okay. a very warm welcome. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. I just want to be uh, upfront, uh, be grateful and thankful for inviting me to this uh, panel of esteemed speakers. Uh, uh, just need to clarify, during my undergrad and grad school, I did uh, study a lot of uh, issues regarding the critical infrastructure. And I will put the cybersecurity, try to put it in that uh, context, uh, context. And mostly my studies were critical infrastructure based in the United States, which comes under the Department of Home Homeland Security. So I'll start with that. And then I'll uh, uh, take an avenue towards uh, Pakistan's uh, in, uh, critical infrastructure and cyber th uh, threat. I just need to, if I may, I just need to, um, the last question Mr. Siddiqui asked uh, by, uh, from Mr. Uh, Francisco regarding Pakistan's nuclear um, uh, threat to Pakistan's nuclear, um, uh, uh, status. If I can just, uh, I've written a few papers on that. So I have a little bit of understanding on, of it. One needs to very clarify, define what is Pakistan's nuclear uh, status. One is the power generation and the other is weaponization. Now, if I could understand Mr. Obas's question clearly, he was actually talking about the threat to the uh, both of them. And the reason is- Exactly. The, uh, the reason is behind that Pakistan's, uh, um, about their uh, three uh, presently uh, nuclear reactors, which are working, which are under the safeguard of I, uh, NPT, which is the CANAP in Karachi, south of pa uh, Pakistan, and they're building CANAP 2 and CANAP 3. And then there's Chashma 1 and Chashma 2. These uh, will eventually end up being five nuclear uh, power plants. They come under the uh, NPT treaty. So they're safeguarded. And for them to have an access for IAE and that that's very clear for them. They can go in there, they can do inspections every time they want and they want to ensure that the uranium is safeguarded over there. But the problem with the international community has been towards the unsafeguarded material which comes out of uh, Khushab one, two, and they're building the uh, one, two, three, and they're building the fourth one. That's the main problem over there. That's the weaponization material that comes out of there and they're always looking for it. They want to always come in there and see what they're doing. And the access that, as far as I know, this is not, a, it's uh, having conversation with the scientists and people who are in charge over there, that they have a very good uh, cyber uh, apparatus over there for secure, securing that, the, that they're, uh, I mean, they do admit that they're being trying to, there are several attacks that come on daily basis over there. And um, it comes from the east side of the border and comes from all over. And one of the actual person uh, told me, informed me they actually come from the people who don't like the weaponization program over there, that country's of origin. So that was kind of, uh, I just want to elaborate on that. That's, uh, that's a, it's a problem that comes from the, the way people ask the question. When they say the nuclear program, they, there's a default um, um, uh, issue over here where both the weaponization program and the power generation, they're joined together. However, Pakistan keeps them very separate. And it is, uh, you know, I've looked into it, I've talked to it, I've done good research on it. And it, 
it is commendable how Pakistan has kept the CANAP one working and Cheshma one and Cheshma two working. It, I mean, they have never violated any treaty. There, there has never been any, uh, you know, breakdown of security over there, being uh, cyber or personnel. So this is just an assumption that there is some guy with a beard like me in a turban who's going through the weaponization program and getting all the secrets. There's just, you know, that's an assumption part of everywhere. It's a bias, so we have to live with it. Now, coming back to the critical uh, infrastructure, after uh, the tragic events of 9-11, uh, the United States had, uh, it, most of its critical infrastructures were under uh, regulatory uh, agencies, which were not, as uh, President Bush, Bush uh, once put it, in a very mundane way, they were not, one hand was not talking to the other. So they built up the Department of Homeland Security. And the Department of Homeland Security, it is the second largest budgetary appropriation in the United States after the Department of Defense. I think Department of Defense budget is close to like $800 billion a year. And they are uh, not behind, they're about $300 billion. And it covers about 17 agencies, start with FEMA, start with uh, port security and other critical infrastructures. But the problem, with, uh, the good thing about the United States and its critical infrastructure is they're very well designed and they're very well protected. And the policy that they actually institutionalize on them is very well defined. You, you, it's, you know, it's, they have small points that they go through. I'll give you a uh, issue, not, not that many people do it, uh, understand is that after the 9-11, uh, they had actually put what they call fusion centers. And they're about fifth, uh, as far as I think 72 fusion centers and other folks might, uh, uh, Ms. Dabbs probably know about it. All the information everywhere comes in there and that and then gets decimated to other agencies. So they have a little bit of a bottleneck over there they check on things. So they have a very good system. Nonetheless, it has faults in it. But if you take out the critical infrastructure away from that and go around the world, it has been a problem for the rest of the world since the beginning of warfare. The warfare meaning you go back times of Alexander the Great, the Romans and the Muslims invading, Arabs invading. The first thing they did was they went near a state, they went and poisoned the wells they messed up the uh, livestock. So they wanted to have a stranglehold on that adversary, real good. They want to create havoc over there. And critical infrastructure these days is exactly works exactly the same way. During uh, 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 World War II, the Americans, especially the Americans, the first thing they did to de destroy the German uh, Nazis uh, war machine that they went and bombed Hamburg. And that is known as, as the worst bombing, aerial bombing in the history of mankind so far. They dropped more bomb tonnage of bombs on Hamburg that was combined between the atomic bombs on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. They wanted to level their infrastructure. Similarly, when they went and bombed what they call lightning of Tokyo, they did exactly the same thing. So this infra critical infrastructure is, has to be protected. And now we have come forward from mechanical aspects to cyber. And that is something that we should be very careful about. And uh, you know, giving you examples is uh, what uh, uh, the first speaker, was it Mr. Uh, Rosenweig? He actually talked about it, that how the other countries, they try to hit, uh, United States, because United States is, you know, everybody needs to understand the richest country, they got a lot of resources, and you want to go and uh, hit the uh, biggest bear over there in the jungle. So that's why they come under the United States. Now, let me go back and uh, get into the issues of Pakistan and its uh, critical infrastructure. Pakistan is one of those states which is actually called a national security state. Number one being, number one being the United States itself. It is a national security state. One needs to understand, it says in the constitution, the preamble, 
common defense. And the common defense in the United States is the national security, internal and external. And Article 1 and 2, if you read them clearly, and somebody, if somebody needs to study them, they talk about the national defense. For the United States, national defense is paramount. And critical infrastructure comes underneath it. And that's the reason that when uh, after 9-11, they came up with the Bush Doctrine, which was preemption. If they saw something, they're not going to go and negotiate. They're not going to go and talk and make things clear. They will go and destroy it and then talk about it. So the preemption issue was great. And that's why I asked the question, are there any preemptions? Which are? United States does preemption everywhere. It did in Iran during the, uh, prior to the negotiation on nuclear, nuclear deal, they did that over there, along with Israel. Israel is number two uh, national security state. Since uh, the creation of Israel 1948, it is a national security state. It has in its constitution, and I think since 1949, they have a state of emergency over there. They can check on anyone. You go to, I don't know if anyone has gone to Israel. I have I've never been, but I've heard from even uh, American diplomats from Department of uh, Defense, they've gone to Israel and they're treated like a common criminal. They'll check on everything. They'll check on their cell phone. They want to go into their Gmail addresses, everything. And some of them have even returned that we, I'm not going to go. If you have a conference, we can do a Zoom conference, but I'm not going to go there. So Israel is the, the number two. There are other secure, national security state, but Pakistan in general is a national security state. And once you declare yourself or build up on the premises that you are a national security state, then there are certain issues that go out of the window. And if I could uh, relate to, there was a report that came out and I think a few years ago, 2015 was by Privacy International where it says the tipping and scale security and surveillance in Pakistan. It is about 60, 70 pages long. I can put a um, link over here. It actually talks about how Pakistan actually does surveillance on its own citizen and how it, it is with impunity. In the United States, you wanna do a surveillance, you have to get a court order. Israel doesn't have to do it. They, they just send the military over there, they'll take care of it. In Pakistan, they do it. And in that case, uh, the famous, the, you know, during the course, it doesn't matter if it's civilian or the military, they will do surveillance on you. And once they're doing surveillance, they compromise the issues related to national uh, critical, um, critical infrastructure. Recently, last month, there was a ransom hacker which went into K-Electric. Probably K-Electric, for those who don't know, is the main power uh, electricity provider in exactly. Karate. Yeah, in the largest city in Pakistan. It's about, some estimates say it's got 20 million people over there. They went there and everybody knows they went there, but nobody knows what they got from there. And one actually person uh, wrote on a tweet that they went there because K Electric gets power from Canop, the nuclear plant over there. They wanted to put a web over there to see what they're doing. It was a non-state actor, but they had figured out who it was. Yeah.